Hello and welcome once again to Crazy Comics and Stories. It's me, your charming and delightful old Uncle Rap Bastard. And I do not have Joe Crazy Rider at the other end of the series of tubes and wires we call the internets because our schedules just did not mesh. Now, Joe is saying that the reason I will do shows without him is because I want to be like Alan Alda, who was on every episode of MASH. Not No other actor was on every episode of MASH. Uh, I, I say it's more because I'm the one who uh, edits and produces and does all the work on the show. But hey, you know, we'll, we'll let Joe have his, we'll let Joe have his, have his thing. But since Joe is not available this week, uh, first I want to apologize. There was no show last week because um, two reasons. One, again, Joe and I weren't able to mesh our schedules. The group home has been asking me to work uh, a lot more than usual, and usually when that happens, Joe and I will record on a Sunday, but he has not been around on Sundays. He's had other things going on, so rather than miss another week, we don't have any fill-ins left, ladies and gentlemen. We've used them all up. We need to actually get some recordings for some more so that when Joe does uh, get busy and is unable to record, we've, we've got stuff in the can. And uh, those of you who know me know that I uh, really kind of get a little irritated when I don't have backups available. So instead, I thought I would uh, have an episode of uh, two of the long, long uh, running uh, side podcasts that we do here for Crazy Comics and Stories, Solitaire Rose Radio and Solitaire Rose Series and Review. And it's a series that I love, not many people know about, but there is a movie coming out this fall, and that is Jack Kirby's The Eternals. And before I get into the series itself, I want to kind of set the stage. The series started in 1976, and there were a few things going on at this time. First, uh, Jack Kirby had left Marvel in 1970, late 69, early 1970, to go over to DC, he signed a five-year contract, and at the end of those five years, he chose not to renew his contract. Rather than reaching out to Stan, he reached out to Roy Thomas. Because he, if he was going to get rejected, he would rather Roy Thomas be the one who bring it to Stan rather than talk to Stan directly. And I've had things like that. You know, imagine you've walked off your job. Screw this place. I'm out of here. And then the new job either doesn't materialize or isn't what you thought it would be. And you have to put your hat in your hand and go back to your old job. Um... I imagine Kirby was a little ashamed and a little, um, he, he didn't do a lot of his own business dealings. Um, through the early part of his life, he had Joe Simon do a lot of his business dealings. And um, he just was, he would prefer to do comics. He didn't want to do the business stuff. And when everything fell apart at DC, back in the late 50s, he went over to Marvel, stayed at Marvel till 1970, then he left. Now he's back at Marvel, and his contract was that he would uh, deliver a certain number of pages. He would write, edit, and draw his own stuff. He did have some input as to the inkers, but at this time Kirby was living on the West Coast, and it was a little odd for a comic artist to live on the West Coast and work for an East Coast company. This is before there was FedEx. This is before there was, you know, next day delivery. This is before there were fax or emails and everything. And most artists in comics, the, the comic companies wanted them to live in New York so they could come in and deliver the art. And uh, in some cases, uh, Mark Evaners told stories about this, if the art didn't deliver so that the editor could drive out to the artist's house and bang on the door to get that art. But the last thing they had to worry about with Jack was him not delivering stuff on time. Jack was um, usually ahead of time. Jack never had a deadline issue that anyone can remember or has heard of. And again, that's from Mark Evaner who talked about that Jack was always early with delivering his stuff. Now, when he came back to Marvel, there were a lot of ideas for what they wanted to do. In fact, there is a memo that recently surfaced between Roy Thomas and Stan, where Stan didn't much care for Jack Kirby's dialogue and scripting. But it was in the contract that Jack got to script his own stuff because he was still... Um, Still a little peeved about the Stan Lee stuff, where Stan took a lot of the credit for his plotting and creations 
And while that isn't the main reason he left Marvel, there are a lot of reasons he left Marvel. At DC, one of the things in his contract was that he scripted his own stuff. And when he came to Marvel, he wanted the same thing. And later, when he was able to get Mike Royer to do the inking on his work, a lot of the time he would just have the completed pages. They had been uh, penciled, inked. The lettering had been roughed in because the writer was the one who determined balloon placement. And if Kirby was doing the writing, he's the one who determined the balloon placement. It would just be delivered to Marvel. They would just have to color it and letter it and, and go from there. The letters pages were all done at Marvel, which was something that Jack was a little irritated about after time. He said that uh, the people at Marvel corporate didn't care for his comics and wanted to put in a bunch of negative letters to kind of force him to take on a scripter. Whether that's true or not, I, I don't think I'll ever know unless somebody at Marvel actually steps forward and says, yeah, that's what we did. But I don't think anybody at Marvel would ever say that. So Jack Kirby came to Marvel. He had a number of books that he was going to be working on. Captain America, um, The Eternals, uh, 2001, and Black Panther. He had four series. Some were monthly, some were bi-monthly. Um, the Eternals and... Uh, Captain America were both monthly. And because Jack was on the West Coast, and Jack kind of did his own thing, his books did not tie into the Marvel Universe proper. This was at a time when Marvel would have a lot of crossovers for new series. Um, at the time, uh, you know, the X-Men, uh, Nightcrawler would show up in Spider-Man to kind of let people know that, hey, there's this new X-Men book. There was Marvel Team-Up and Marvel 2-in-1 where characters would meet each other. Writers who knew each other well would blend their stories together. Jim Starlin and Steve Englehart would have elements from their stories kind of mixing together because they were friends and worked together a lot. Roy Thomas, very big on having stuff from one book to the other. He, his Fantastic Four and Gary Conway's Fantastic Four tied him with the Avengers and tied him with other stuff. So Marvel was kind of interconnected. Not as interconnected as it would get into the 80s and 90s, but it was very interconnected. And Jack didn't really want any part of that. He kind of did his stuff on his own. He didn't know what anybody else was doing. When his books came out, they did not tie into the larger Marvel Universe proper. The 70s also had a kind of a weird phenomenon. And it still goes on today. It's just not as big a part of the culture. But the 70s was kind of this explosion of what they called ancient astronauts. Or that the theory put forth by Eric Von Daniken in Chariots of the Gods that a lot of the Aztec and Inca drawings were actually that of aliens who had landed on Earth. And the they taught the Aztecs and the Incans how to build pyramids and create waterways and, and stuff like that. And there there is a big part of me that really finds that uh, almost offensive at this point that oh well because these civilizations weren't in europe they they didn't know anything sorry a pyramid's one of the easiest things to build and probably one of the most stable things to build if rome and the people in the middle east and the people in egypt could figure out how to route water from one place to another the Aztecs and the Incas could do so as well. But there was really a huge boom in this ancient astronaut, gods from outer space. And Jack Kirby, who absorbed all of this stuff and would bring it through in comics. If you if you ever read Jack Kirby stuff, it, it grabs from the times, but it also moves toward the future. I always point to the Forever People, which was Kirby kind of looking at the hippie movement and ingesting it and running it through his brain and then turning it into a kind of a superhero book to the point where it really didn't feel like hippies. It was just his interpretation through the superhero lens and through his creativity. So when you get to the Eternals, the Eternals is that whole Chariots of the Gods, ancient astronauts thing put through the Kirby lens and made into a comic book. 
Is man alone in the universe? Every myth and legend to emerge from the distant past points towards strange visitations from the stars, beings of great power who have been on this earth and then departed. Who were they? What did they do here? Where have they gone? These awesome questions create the background for this exciting new saga of a day which lies ahead. The day of answers. The day of the gods. The Eternals came out in 1976. In the first issue, it shows the three main characters in the in the early issue. Ike Harris, Icarus, Dr. Damien and his daughter. And it starts with them exploring a new cavern they have found with all sorts of ancient astronaut and Incan and Mayan sculptures and such drawn as only Kirby could do it. Um, we have a splash page which shows the three characters very small, just emphasizing this Kirby-esque machinery. And then the second, third page is a double page spread. When Kirby was at DC, he, he really kind of mastered the double page spread where he would have a splash page and then two pages with this huge image. And again, this is another huge image of what looks like a spaceship through Mayan, and Incan art um, with our lead characters. Very, very, very small. There are no superhero costumes anywhere in this comic on the cover, which was a rarity for Marvel at the time. Even when Marvel would do a movie adaptation like Logan's Run, they would take the costumes from the movie and kind of superheroize them because superheroes were what sold. Um, they had tried the horror. They had ridden the horror boom. The horror boom at Marvel didn't last very long. It quickly turned into a reprint boom where they reprinted stuff from the 50s. And even their main, their main horror books, Tomb of Dracula, uh, Frankenstein's Monster, Werewolf by Night, had superhero trappings. Because when somebody picked up a Marvel book, they expected superheroes and they wanted it all to tie into the marvel universe so yes tomb of dracula tied into the marvel universe werewolf by night tied into the marvel universe and on and on and on kirby did not do that so the story begins with the professor his daughter and ike harris in this huge tomb and the way kirby draws the figures very small and all of the sculptures being huge it gives this book a feel of being bigger than life of being just monstrously huge. The next page is another splash page, another full page, more of the artifacts that look like a ancient man's version of science fiction ideas. The characters all still very, very small. Kirby is giving us kind of this hugeness to the story that will echo through the entire run. He wanted this to feel big. He wanted it to feel important. He had had the new gods cut off. The new gods, which uh, everybody now knows Darkseid, because Darkseid is really one of the few villains that DC has that they exploit a lot, other than the Joker and Lex Luger. And Kirby really brought forth that bigness from the new gods, wanted to bring that into this series, knowing that at Marvel, he would have to do something different. He was tying in with Eric Von Daniken, Chariots of the Gods, Ancient Astronaut stuff, because he felt it was more saleable than what he had done over at DC. He still wanted to deal with myths and gods interacting with humanity, but he wanted to go at it from a different direction. Also at this time, Marvel was introducing a lot of new characters and a lot of new superheroes. They had really put forth a whole bunch of reprint books to kind of squeeze out any new publishers who came along in the mid-70s. And while the reprint books had all kind of faltered, they still wanted to fill the stands. DC was planning what they called the DC Explosion. They were going to ramp up the size of their books. They were going to put out a whole bunch of new books and Marvel felt that they needed to do the same thing to kind of get that shelf space. So this was the time when I started reading comics and I was used to a lot of first issues where you would get an origin of a superhero 
and you know his first villain which would usually end up being his main villain and then an issue or two later you'd get spider-man or the thing or somebody else so that you knew that this was squarely in the marvel universe kirby goes in a very different direction with his first issue he's very much creating the stage and having our three characters go through to kind of give us this idea of the ancient gods having been among the Mayans, among the Incans. And these three characters are very much kind of bringing us into this world and treating it as if it's not part of the Marvel Universe, but it's its own thing. So there is a lot of exposition in this story, a lot of... Um, a lot of talk about how we're seeing human history here that hasn't been seen before. Very much a secret history of the human race. A secret history that only now is starting to come forward. Ike Harris, who is their guide in this, is starting to act strange. He's starting to talk about things that there's no way that anybody could have known before. And as we get to the uh, fifth and sixth pages, we get back to Kirby's standard six panels page layout he would either do a four or six panel layout so that the he could do the kind of storytelling that he did but and we very quickly switch over to a airline pilot who's flying over uh where is it here it's in the Pacific waters that brush the South American shores. We're kind of given the idea that this is really close to where Ike Harris and the professor and his daughter are. And all of a sudden this plane is attacked. We don't know why. Kirby does a lot of the, they call it the, the Kirby crackle, which is he would have dots in the, in the ocean or in the air to show energy crackling. And artists who have used this technique talk about how it's not making the dots, it's what you draw around them that kind of really shows the energy. The pilot ejects. We don't know anything more about him because this is our introduction of Crow and the Deviants. The Deviants are the villains of this series. As we learn later on, they and the Eternals have been locked in conflict since they were created. But right now, we just know that this is a man named Crow, and they they are on the ocean floor. We know that Crow is speaking to a leader. The leader is very arrogant, but we don't get his name. We don't know what's going on. We just know he's kind of a jerk, ordering Crow to find out what's going on. Whatever is happening in that ancient crypt with Ike Harris and the professor needs to be stopped. Then get a beautiful drawing of the undersea city that the deviants live in as we go back to our our main characters ike harris is explaining that um, these ancient gods have been around and now he is sending a signal he then explains that uh, it all began with the coming of the gods to earth when it was still populated by only the beasts of the field. Still, it was the presence of life which drew them, these cosmic beings, to the planet. Their huge space vessel surveyed the land and descended. They picked out a evolving ape and ran experiments on it and evolved it into three groups. The deviants, an ever-changing and destructive failure. The human, the species bred for true balance and structure and disposition. Although he's a destroyer, the human being was also capable of building for peace. The eternal, he was more than a child of the gods than of the earth. He reached for the universe. The deviants are said to be genetically unstable, so they are all different. The eternals, on the other hand, are immune to time and death. Like the gods, they live apart from all living beings. So in this first issue, here we go. Here's the conflict. Here are the players that are involved. And we then get a history lesson of what happened between the humans and the deviants and the Eternals. Um, we do know that Crow and his people are trying to get to where Icarus and and the professor and his daughter are, because while they have been preparing for the gods to return, they do not want them to return. We're not told why they don't want them to return. 
That's a mystery that would be later on. He makes it to where they are. Uh, when he shows up, he sees Ike Harris. The battle begins. Ike Harris is actually able to stop their forces through hand waving, literally. We get a lot of Kirby's exciting battle sequences here where he does some more information dump. And then on the last page, we do see the ship arrive. When the ship shows up, they all rush to see where it is and they're waiting for it to arrive. And that's our first issue. A couple of things I wanted to point out. The Deviant's home is called Lemuria. And this comes from Lem Lemuria, which is a continent that was proposed in 1864 by zoologist Philip Sclatter to have sunk beneath the Indian Ocean. And um, I know that most people know of Atlantis. This was more the Indian Ocean. And the reason he did it, the reason it's called Lemuria, is it was to explain lemurs because he, as a zoologist, he could not find any ancestral creatures that led to lemurs or that were connected with lemurs. So he posited that there was a continent in the Indian Ocean where these creatures were and the lemurs were the only things that survived. The other thing about this issue is it is a huge information dump. Ike Harris explains what the Eternals are about, what the Deviants are about, how humans tie into this, all of the history. The, the other thing is that when the Deviants do show up, he's able to dispatch them by literally just holding up his hands and building a wall of force. They are not any sort of threat to him. And our fight scene, because back in the 70s, Marvel always had to have a fight scene, is literally two or three pages and then done. This was very much Kirby setting the stage for what he wanted as a very long-running series. Um, the other thing about this issue, written, drawn, and edited by Jack Kirby, and it was inked by John Verputin, or Verporten, I don't know how it's pronounced. He was an inker, at, but also an office manager. He was the guy that you gave your um, pay voucher to, and then he would write out the checks. And there are a lot of rumors that he gave people advances on their pay, gave people advances on issues they hadn't done yet if they were having financial trouble. He passed away in either 76 or 77, very suddenly, and it was discovered that he had been doing this. Of course, you know, Marvel was kind of a haphazard organization at that point, but it still would have been something that contributed to the fact that in the... If you look at Marvel in the 70s, you'll see series where one guy writes one issue, somebody else writes and draws the next issue. Maybe they stay on for two or three. They would have reprint. They would have reprints. Um, they had some fill-ins. When Marv Wolfman was editor-in-chief in, -chief in uh, 75 and part of 76, he instituted a thing where every book needed to have at least one fill-in story if the creators were late. And if you read the books, boy, you could really tell because it's very much a, well, you know, uh, the dreaded deadline doom is hit, but here's a story you'll like. Kirby never had a fill-in, never had a fill-in during this time because, again, he was always on time. So that is the first issue of The Eternals. So next issue. The next issue, in your right in your upper uh, left-hand corner, which is where they usually had the character blurb, so that if you saw, you know, saw the book and it was just the top of the book, you could at least see the character. Icarus, Ike Harris, is in his superhero costume that he had not been in in the first issue. It actually says on the cover, more fantastic than the chariots of the gods. This is it, the coming of the Eternals. And again, there are no superhero costumes on this cover. If you were picking this book up thinking it was going to be a superhero book, uh, you would look at it, and while it's a fantastic Kirby cover, nobody's in costumes, nobody's flying, it's they're all reacting to the uh, spaceship landing, and the blasts, and Kirby, Kirby crackle, and rocks flying all around. It is written, edited, and drawn again by Jack Kirby, inked by John Veer Putin. This was when Marv Wolfman was the editor-in-chief, so he is listed as consulting editor. 
our splash page is this wonderful page that you know we've if you watch anything on the history channel about ancient aliens you've seen those drawings on the hillside that are still there kirby takes those transposes them to a landing strip feel and it's this really beautiful page that has this mayan design with kirby energy all around it it just says witness now what may happen soon this was the first issue i picked up as a kid and you are just thrown into the deep end because the second page is a beautiful two-page spread of this celestial ship landing and it says here it happens on a broad plateau high in the Andes Mountains, where ancient markings laid down by a vanished race still beckon to the stars. The answer has come with a mighty crack of cosmic thunder. A great shadow has leaped the galaxies and appeared in the skies above Earth. Great flashes probe the plain and silent ruins. A spacecraft of the indescribable dimensions descends. The gods have returned. And much like the early pages of issue one, it's the image of this massive, beautifully drawn spaceship with all of our characters very small in the foreground. As a kid, I cannot tell you how cool this page was. It was very awe-inspiring. It was, oh, wow. This is the second page of the comic, and it's huge. Something's going on. Then we have another splash page, which shows our four characters. And they kind of introduce them. Revelations of an astounding nature are already preceded in the arrival of the space gods, for the onlookers at the scene represent the three dominant species generated by the gods' first visit to Earth millions of years ago. Was it chance that brought these witnesses here, or a destiny yet to be fulfilled? Crow introduces himself. Um, the gods seem mighty indeed, but I am Crow. I command the deviants. Scorned and misshapen, by pow but powerful in ways that may even surprise the gods. The professor, I can't speak for all humans, but I assure you my daughter and I came here without the slightest notion of running into this. And Ike Harris says, my species, the Eternals, have been preparing for this for a thousand of your years. We then move into the story proper. Um, we have Crow ranting about what the deviants have to say about the space gods returning. Everything is collapsing around them. And this is when um, Ike Harris has to sort of deal with the crow ranting and raving and saying he's going to destroy them all. And then he says, uh, think well upon the gods, Icarus. The Incas worshipped them and vanished. Their hero, Tetsamatotan, befriended the gods and vanished. And now you've come here to welcome them and you shall be buried for your pains. And Icarus, of course, okay. So be it. There is risk in solving a mystery. We then get another beautiful full page spread of uh, the, 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 this cavern filled with statues is starting to collapse and the deviants all run to their ship to escape. And it's a full page spread. And again, the statues are massive the the stairs are massive the ship that the deviants have shown up is huge and we don't get um we do not get uh, the, the figures are all very small they are not the focus of this book the individual characters are not the focus of this book it is the grandeur of what is happening the bigness of what is happening kind of like in the fantastic four when galactus showed up you know, at the time, comic book readers were like, wow, this is a big deal. But this shows that Kirby was able to go even bigger. And in a lot of ways, this is even bigger. Because Kirby is, like always, after uh, he left Marvel, he is playing with the big toys. He wants to tell myths for a modern age. Whether he succeeds or not is up to you to decide. But as a Kirby fan. This stuff, there's so much power and so much energy in these early issues. And the good thing is, in the New Gods, he sort of created the the um, the, the the situation. And that was just throwing characters at you left and right so fast that it was hard to keep up. Here in the Eternals, he's actually taking some time to slow down with the characters. The plot is moving ahead 
full blast. But he's spending time with the characters so you get to know them, you get to understand them. And through this, uh, Icarus is very much your calm leader. Everything's fine. We're here to solve the mysteries. We're here to deal with the, the Celestials returning. The Deviants are very hot-headed, you know, bad guys. And the humans are just sort of caught in between all of this. They have no no say in anything that's going on. They're just being dragged along for the ride. And as you read the series, the human beings involved, while, while they're in the series and Kirby uses them as kind of the reader's foil, they are part of the story. If anything, they're kind of incidental and they seem like they don't, first off, they don't know what's going on and they react out of, the, out of their ignorance and out of fear. But they're just kind of bit players in this in this story about Deviance Eternals and, and the Celestials deciding the fate of Earth. You then get another information dump. Icarus gives the history of Deviants playing preying on mankind from the past. He even says that they're the ones who caused the flood that's in the Bible. As this is going on, Icarus is leading them to what is known as the Resurrection Chamber. And when he gets to the Resurrection Chamber, he uh, plays with some Kirby machinery and a Eternal called Ajak and the warriors who were with him are brought back. And this is one of the more important ideas in the Eternals that they don't die. You can scatter their atoms and they'll still be able to reform. They, they exist forever. They are eternal because they were created by the Celestials for some reason. And the mystery is, why did the Celestials create them? So when Ajax returns, first off, I got to say, this page, Ajax's costume is amazing. And I really wish he would have played a bigger part in this. It's this wonderful kind of a mix between the stuff that Kirby created for Thor and Mayan architecture. And it's really clear that Kirby did his homework. He, he'd seen how, he'd seen how these things were put together and uh, did a wonderful job. Ajak is your happy warrior and he is here to serve the Celestials and he's glad they're back because he's going to be working alongside them. And that's why I think it's a shame that he's not in the series much. But once they show up, they go to work at getting everything ready for the Celestials to return. This machinery has been in place for over a thousand years. They know what they need to do. They were stored for it. And as this is going on, Icarus is explaining what's happening to both the two humans and the reader. And when we get to the end of the book, one of the Celestials slowly descends from the ship. And our last page is yet another Kirby splash page showing our first Celestial, Arishem, leader of the fourth host. And Kirby explains, he will stand upon it for 50 earth years, towering like towering like the surrounding mountains above all life below. And on the last day of the 50th year, he will step forth from the pylon. And on that day, Earth will either live or die. This is an odd book for Marvel. And it's odd for me when I read it back and how much I loved it when I was uh, 14. Was I 14? No, I was 12. I was 12 when I was reading this because there's no fight scene. There's so much action and so much going on. And Kirby does his explanation in such a way that it doesn't feel like he's doing a data dump because there's always motion in his characters. There's always things moving. And through this whole book, there is a feeling of urgency, a feeling that things are barreling forward faster than, uh, faster than in other, than, than you can keep up with. And I think that pace is something that Kirby, through his art and his storytelling, is able to keep up. And other comic creators, especially at the time, there was that sense during the fight scenes, but during the non-fight scenes, it was very talking heads. It was very much a 
a slower pace and because they were more writer driven at the time marvel you know the, the editors were always writers um the writers were the ones assigned to a series to kind of be in charge of it and they would get artists to work with them but it was very much a writer driven company Whereas over at DC, one of the things they tried to do, they tried to make it a more artist-driven company by putting Carmine Infantino in charge. But Carmine rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. He came in during a time when the business was in trouble. Uh, I would say that he made a lot of bad business decisions. And he let his personality get involved in running the company rather than using the people who were in place to run the company and him guiding them. Um, but that's a story for another podcast. So we get to the third issue. When we get to the third issue, on the cover, we have Icarus in his superhero costume, which in the comic we still haven't seen yet. And he is being blasted by a spaceship that looks a little like the Deviant ship, but is a, has a different design. And one of the things about this book is Icarus is going to be our main character, it seems. He is the only Eternal we've really had since issue one. Um, Ajak is there, but it's very clear that Ajak is a secondary character. And it's also very clear that the humans involved are just being dragged along so Icarus has somebody to talk to. But this is the first issue where we see a superhero cover. And it cannot be that they said, hey, look, sales aren't doing too well. You need to get a superhero on the cover. Because by the third issue, they're not... E by the time the third issue's in production of a monthly comic, at this point in the 70s, they had not gotten sales reports yet. The first issue had not gone on sale by the time the third issue is being put to bed. Our splash page is the first one that's not huge. You know, in the previous two, the splash page has made a very big deal about the fact that they are in this chamber and everything in the chamber is huge and the human figures and our hero are all very small. This is more a standard, more a standard comic book opening with uh, Ajak using a Kirby machine, Ajak and Icarus talking in a way to kind of bring the viewer up to speed as to what's going on in this issue. You know, one of the great celestials has landed. It is Erishem, the leader of the fourth host. The mission of the gods is now clear. This is the hour of Earth's trials. Icarus is now asking, Ajak is explaining things to Icarus, whereas before Icarus was explaining things to the humans, because Ajax knows why the gods have returned. And as a kid, I thought, oh, they're going to watch Earth for 50 years and make judgment on whether we live and die. Now, Kirby knew that he wouldn't be around in 50 years to do comics. He was in his 50s at this time. But the 50-year idea was something that they could go, okay, Kirby was very good about knowing he was creating things that would get handed off to other people. And they were giving it kind of that finite idea um, was something Marvel was kind of doing at the time. They had their future history actually all written out. Where, okay, in 1985, we've got cyborgs, that's when the Deathlock series happened, and then in the 90s, the Martians invade, which leads to War of the Worlds, and then this happens, that leads to this, all the way up to the Guardians of the Galaxy in the year 3000. Yes, the original Guardians of the Galaxy were set a thousand years out in the future because uh, the Legion of Superheroes was set a thousand years in the future. And the early Legion, I'm sorry, the first Guardians of the Galaxy story, really kind of a sideways knockoff of the Legion of Superheroes. Um, again, this is inked by John Veer Putin. And again, we get a two-page spread. This is of Arishem's head and hand. And because he's going to be making his judgment, his hand has this intricate design on the thumb and palm and part of the palm and kirby's gods are very much well the celestials are very much moder modeled on that incan mayan look with a humanoid figure 
but very bizarre headdresses and very strange looks and just physically imposing and drawn in a way that makes them feel like they are above what's going on that they are that they are really the the hand that stirs the pot the uh, the thing in charge and it goes back to how kirby would do stories about galactus before stan lee got involved where galactus is so powerful and so big humans are beneath his notice over time stan brought galactus down to where he and reed richards almost by by the by this time when Galactus showed up, he and Reed Richards knew each other and would have philosophical debates. Whereas when Kirby did it in the first story, Galactus was what are, what are these gnats? What are these gnats bothering me? Um, Kirby was going back to that bigness, that unknowing, and the forces beyond humanity, forces beyond what we can control. Um, our destiny is in the hands of things much more powerful than us who care very little about us. Um, we do not get a fourth, we do not get another splash page after this. Instead, we get more explanation how the Celestials will judge Earth. And also that uh, what's going to happen is now that Erishem is here, this whole mountainside, this whole mountain and area is going to be sort of walled off. There's going to be an energy barrier around it that nothing can get in or out. And Icarus is explaining to them what's going to be happening during the judgment period. It happens fast because on the next page, the alarms are going off. The barrier is about to be put up. Icarus and the professor's daughter go to escape. He wants to stay. He has spent his whole life searching for this. He knows he will not live another 50 years, but he wants to spend the rest of his life here, learning about the Celestials, learning about the Eternals. His daughter, of course, is, no, no, you must come with us. I'll never see you again. Icarus is forcing her to leave. They get in a plane and take off. And then we go back to the Deviants, and we see the crow is being punished because he knew the gods were returning to Earth and he failed to stop them. Very much along the lines of what Darkseid would do to his minions when they failed. Kirby was very big on showing the, the head bad guy punishing his minions when they failed. If you go to his Captain America stories, the Red Skull was always uh, punishing the people who failed him. And I think a lot of that comes from Kirby's experience of World War II, where it was said that if you failed Hitler, he would cast you out, he would throw you into prison, et cetera, et cetera. And whenever Kirby talked about evil, it always went back to his experiences in World War II. So a lot of his best villains have that same feel of the stories he did about World War II in that that is how he saw evil operated. Whereas Ditko, who had not served in World War II, his villains were more average guys who just didn't either didn't believe they should play by the rules or something had happened so that they had to play outside the rules. Kirby always thought bigger. He always was, uh, his, his, his villains had more that they were evil, but in many ways they were either made that way like Dr. Doom, or they thought that they were heroes like Magneto or Dr. Doom or uh, many of the villains in the uh, later Fantastic Four. It's odd that we didn't get a splash page after the two-page spread, but we do get one for Crow in a very Kirby-esque machine um, being basically being strapped up. Crow is saying that, no, no, I can still stop the gods. I can still stop the gods. Um, we get more information on how the Deviant's social structure is, why they use Crow rather than the uh, leader going out. And then um, we go back to Icarus and the professor's daughter, Margot, escaping from what has happened at this point. In order to kind of get some more superhero -ish stuff in there, after Icarus kind of explains what's going to be happening, why they're leaving, and where they're going. They're going to New York 
to um, meet up with another Eternal who's there. Icarus kind of just jumps out of the plane to show that he can fly, to kind of show off the superhero powers. They go to New York. As he's doing this, they're attacked by the Deviants. And after the attack, this is uh, just, what, one page of the attack. Icarus gets back in the plane and they vanish. The Deviants have no idea where they went, but instead this is an excuse for Kirby to show that Icarus has changed the plane into a spaceship. They go up through the atmosphere, back down to New York, where he meets with Cersei, and we get a splash page for the introduction of Cersei. She is in a New York apartment with filled with Kirby machinery, and she is dancing. And they say, the apartment interior, an almost alien sight, no more startling than the graceful female figure soaring through the air. You are as you've always been, Cersei, beautiful, charming, inspiring to watch. To say any more would exhaust the adjectives in a thousand languages. She then says, oh, you're just flattering me, so I won't turn you into a pig. And we uh, are basically told that uh, she is the basis for the basis for the sirens in the Odyssey, who turned Odysseus and his men into pigs when they misbehaved. So this is more of the, 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 the myths and the gods of the past were really all based on Eternals. And Kirby, after using Thor and the Norse gods in that series, here he's digging more into the Greek myth as we go on. Icarus, of course, Icarus who flew too close to the sun. Um, Circe, uh, we'll see later on. Uh, Ajax, another one. We'll see as we go through the series that that's a theme he has running through, that the, the people and the myths of that people have thought were gods were really part of this battle between the humans and the deviants. And the deviants were... Um, thought of as demons by human beings and they really liked that because it scared the humans and the Eternals who have been fighting them are seen as gods so going back to the new gods, going back to Thor and you, the use of gods among men, very much a Kirby theme the uh, conversation and, and things they have in the apartment are very mundane Sort of that contrast between, you know, all of the cosmic stuff we've seen in the previous two and a half issues, and now we're going down to the mundane. And because the Deviants have figured out that Icarus has come to New York, they're going to invade, and that's how our, that's how the uh, third issue ends. Now, I've gone almost an hour, and I've only gotten three issues. I was going to do five, but I figure three is enough. So what's going to be happening? This is going to spin off into its own little little series, Solitaire Rose Series in Review. It will be on the same feed as Crazy Comics and Stories. And one of the reasons I cut down on all the podcasts I did is because last year during the pandemic, I had become an essential worker at both jobs. And what that meant was, at the office job, yes, I was working from home, but they needed people to work later. Um, we were put on more and more clients. I had less and less time. And then at the group home, if you listen to my podcast in uh, any sort of way, you know that at the group home, they ramped up my hours a lot because we uh, the, all the houses were in quarantine. And while the quarantine is kind of lifted, it's still very much all hands on deck, lots of open hours, lots of them needing me to be there. It has started to abate a bit, and I have forced them to kind of give me some time off. So Solitaire Rose Radio, where I do interviews and uh, other solo stuff. That's going to be slowly starting up again on a regular schedule. The uh, Solitaire Rose series in review is one I really, really desperately want to do. I've got so much stuff here stacked up and all these notes, and I just need to do like I did tonight, which is settle down, turn on the headphones, and get recording. I'm hoping to do this every two weeks. So in two weeks, we will get part two of the Eternals. I don't know if I will be able to do the five uh, issues that I wanted to do, or if I'll just do three, or if, you know, if I did five ish issues, that'd be 90 minutes. And I think that's a little long 
for something like this. If you want to read Jack Kirby's Eternals, there are tons of ways to do so. There are two trade paperbacks available from Marvel, um, Volume 1 and 2, which reprint the series. It was a 19-issue series with an annual, so it was popular enough for an annual, but it just never really sold a whole lot. And we'll get into why and my theories behind that. If you are like me and you like the big old expensive books, there is an Eternals omnibus. There was one that came out in 2009, which just had the Kirby series. And uh, that one was going for stupid money up to a year ago. I think I saw people on Amazon and eBay listing it at five, 600 bucks. But they have since put out a new Eternals omnibus, which reprints the the Kirby series, and then the 12-issue miniseries from the 80s, and then the Eternals one-shot, which was going to be a series of Marvel Comics Presents, but instead they put it out as a one-shot. It's a really nice book. Put it out for the movie. You can also just go to uh, Marvel Unlimited. And I have talked about Marvel Unlimited in the past. It is a service that Marvel has. I think they're charging $9.99 a month now. Um, there is also, if you buy it for a year, it's cheaper. And it is a service where on your tablet, on your cell phone, on your computer, you can read up to 35,000 Marvel comics. They're adding the new stuff about three months after it comes out. And then in the last few weeks, they have started doing books that are just for Marvel Unlimited. So there are a number of ways to read this. I personally love Marvel Unlimited. That's how I'm reading it for this, because if I had the omnibus, it'd be boom on the table, whereas now I got it on my tablet and I can page through to, to match up with my notes. Uh, I want to thank you for listening. Uh, this is a fill-in episode, so next week we'll be back. Uh, Joe and I will be talking about the... Uh, Minnesota Comic Convention, which was a one-day affair over the weekend. Uh, we'll be talking about the Ditko lawsuit, and um, I'll be talking about a couple of the omnibuses I've read, as well as the usual shenanigans. I want to thank everybody for listening. I do not have a dad joke, because I don't do those, but play my music. <laughs>